as well. Diabetes. So you now. Uh, is he recording again? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so chapter 20 is endocrine and hematologic emergencies. Uh, so like the pancreas and blood emergencies. Um, uh, so, um, where do I start? Uh, endocrine systems influences every thing in the body, the cells, organs, and functions. Um, so the endocrine is basically like organs in the body that submit hormones. Um, like the thyroid is a big one. Um, the kidneys have adrenal glands on them that submit adrenaline. Um, and so it, the body's always wanting to keep um, with homeostasis and it uses uh, uh, hormones in some fashion to do that. Uh, endocrine disorders have many uh, signs and symptoms, different ones, like everything else. Uh, hematologic emergencies uh, are difficult to assess and treat. Um, because those are the people that either A, uh, don't clot and they just keep bleeding and bleeding, or the ones that have clotting disorders where they just throw clots or do weird stuff. And usually on meds. Uh, so, the endocrine system is like a kind of like a way of a communication system that controls the function of the body. Um, so the glands secrete messages, uh, the hormones. So like um, the pancreas is a big one that secretes uh, insulin, and another one uh, it secretes a gluc glucagon or glucagon uh, to like if there's too much uh, uh, insulin in the body or sugar, um, it will store it to glucagen or fat. Um, hormones affect all the organs, tissues, and cells. Uh, endocrine disorders are caused by internal communication problems. Like if somebody whose thyroid's messed up, uh, their body will do like weird things, like swell up, or they'll just lose a lot of weight. Uh, glucose metabolism. So the pancreas uh, is what helps. Uh, it develops the insulin, makes insulin, so the it can cells can uh, metabolize the glucose in the in the brain as well as well as the body. It's kind of like a key. Um, if you can think of it like that, like it has to have the right insulin or the right chemicals for it to for the oxygen, like it helps the cells burn off the oxygen or turn into energy. Uh, without the, enough insulin, uh, yeah, the, it goes into like a anaerobic state. Like they try to still s survive, but um, they just don't. They kind of go into emergency mode. Um, glucose metabolism, the pancreas produces and stores the glucagon and insulin. Uh, it's like a few cells on the pancreas. It's called the islets of Lang Langerhans, Langerhans. But they both have the alpha and beta cells. Um, so alpha cells are what produce the glucagon. Um, so that's what like the glucagon stores this fat. And then beta cells produce insulin. So that's what when your body is like in this fight or flight, it produces insulin so it can burn it off into the uh, cells to like, get more, you know, uh, energy. Any questions about that so far? No, okay. Uh, diabetes mellitus impairs the body ability to use glucose for fuel. So there's like a bunch of different diabetes out there, um, but there's insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent overall. Um, 
so like if the pancreas isn't a functioning right and um so it doesn't make the insulin and that's when we have to do people with uh, pancreas issues or diabetes have to do with like meds sometimes like if it's not bad they'll use metformin or if it's pretty bad like uh, type one they'll use insulin or various different types of insulin out there uh, so you need to know the signs and symptoms of that's a poorly written sentence you need to know the signs and symptoms of blue, blood glucose um, so diabetic emergencies there's hypo hyperglycemia which is hypermean hi hi high above normal what does hypoglycemia mean Below normal. Below normal, yep. Uh, so hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can uh, occur with di diabetes, I'm not saying, mellitus type 1 or, and or type 2. Uh, hypoglycemic patients require prompt treatment. Um, and that's one of, you can, EMTs can affect or administer meds for uh, hypoglycemic patients. Um, type one is caused by an autoimmune disorder where the cell, uh, like the body kind of attacks the, the pancreas. Um, and so it makes it, it doesn't make insulin properly or it doesn't make the right kind of insulin. So that it has a key, but just not the right kind of key. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so, um, without that key, the insulin can't get into the cells so they can do their job. And so the cells end up dying, become uh, necrotic, and cannot produce energy as well. Uh, type 1 usually is found um, in young kids. Um, and it's kind of hereditary as well. It can be, but not always. But they have there's like oh my god technology with diabetes today is amazing uh they from when i first got into ems uh they have pumps now um like they look like little beepers um and i saw the other uh, a few weeks ago like somebody had like uh something on their arm and they just waved their phone over it and it took their blood sugar like they don't have to like poke themselves two or three times a day anymore um in the fingers Uh, and yeah, patients with type 1 diabetes cannot survive without insulin. And on that note, Zach, I gotta go. Is he still there? No, I gotcha. All right, let me get set back up, guys, for this. Give me just a second. I thought you were leaving. I thought you were leaving, Zach. <laughs> hey, no. Zach, can I ask a yeah. question? Um, Because I, I think he might have gotten a little confused. Because Type 1, your pancreas is not making insulin, right? And type 2 is your insulin, there's not enough, it, there's not enough receptors for the insulin? Yes. Okay. And um, funny enough, my, my ex, so I, diabetes for some reason is one of those that I struggle grasping. However, my wife, who is a nurse, like I have to ask her all the time because I even, I confuse when it comes to um, diabetes, but yes, you are correct on that. Okay. Um, you have diabetes mellitus. You have mm -hmm. diabetes insipidus, which are two different things. But funny enough, I made it through flight medicine and critical care. I didn't realize that until like the last year. So, uh, chapter twenty-five is that correct or twenty? I'm sorry, guys. We're not seeing you or the slide. Yeah, I'm trying and to pull up that slide. It is 20. 20, okay. Bear with me, and I'll, I'll boot up here in just a second. All right, F5. All right, let me share my screen. You guys gonna have to help me out. Where did we leave off? Or where was he? 
Anybody know what slab you're on? I'm sorry, 13. 13, thank you. Okay. I'll show you. All right. Hold on. All right. Somewhere in here? That's it. Sweet. Let me close this door real quick. Thank you. I probably have some crazy hat here, here, guys, so don't judge me because I just took my hat off. All right. Onset usually happens from early childhood through the fourth decade of life. Uh, so usually type people with type one, they know pretty early in life. Uh, immune system destroys the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin. Patient must obtain insulin from an external source. Uh, patients with type one DD diabetes cannot survive with insulin. Um, many, uh, okay, I think I heard him talk about this. Many type 1 diabetics have an implanted insulin pump. Um, this continuously measures glucose levels and provides insulin. Uh, it limers, limits the number of times patients have to check their finger sticks for glucose levels. However, these can malfunction and diabetic emergencies can develop. Uh, always inquire about the presence of an insulin pump. Um, I will tell you, especially younger children, um, they'll get these pumps and most of them manage them well. However, some of them decide that they need to play with them or there's buttons and they just start pushing things and they can actually kind of end up hurting their self. Um, so, so if they do have one of these pumps, just kind of take note of it um, and keep a good eye on and just ask those questions like, hey, did you happen to, to press more buttons than normal or did you did you change any settings? Especially people who are new to pumps, sometimes they don't know exactly how to set it up right um, and they can kind of get themselves in some trouble. Um, diabetes mellitus type 1 is the most common uh, metabolic disease of children. Uh, new onsets will have symptoms related to eating and drinking. So polyuria, polyadysmia, um, weight loss fatigue. These people are going to be thirsty. They're going to pee a lot. They're going to have weight loss, and they're going to be tired all the times. So if you have a kid complains about being thirsty, is urinating all the time, has weight loss and fatigue, that's something you want to kind of have in the back of your head. Is, is this person possibly diabetic? So normal blood sugar, I would remember this. Just write it down. This will be low for the rest of your career. Is between 80 and 120. Um, when a patient's blood close, gosh, guys, I'm sorry. Technology tonight. I still see your slide, but I keep you. Keep, your voice keeps coming in and out on my. Okay. I don't know if it's me or. I apologize, guys. No, it's him. My computer is struggling today. Um, all right. Uh, when a patient's blood glucose level is above normal, the kidney filtration system becomes overwhelmed and glucose spills into the urine. When glucose is unavailable to the cells, the body turns to burning fat. That's why these, these kids are usually really thin and have that unexplained weight loss. It's, its body is using that fat to try to make up for this. Uh, this produces acid waste called ketones. Um, any ketone level, as ketone levels go up in the blood, they spill into the urine. Um, kidneys cannot pay, maintain this acid-base balance. Um, patients breathe faster and, and deeper. They have those Kuzmal respirations. Their breath is also going to kind of smell fruity. Um, it smells like a really nasty, like fruity or alcohol. Um, think of like the, the crappiest well-flavored vodka you can think of. They kind of have that aftertaste smell. Um, if fat metabolism and key, fat metabolism and ketones uh, produce uh, production and continue, diabetic ketone acidosis can, or ketose acidosis can develop. It as um, abdominal pain, body aches, nausea, vomiting, um, altered mental status, sweatiness. Um, it's uh, it, these patients are really sick. 
Uh, if not recognized and treated, DKA can lead to death. You want to obtain glucose levels with a finger stick using an lead set and a glucometer. These people are going to have a glucose level over a 400, 500, 600. Sometimes your monitor will literally just say high. It won't even give you a number. Um, can anybody tell me what the normal glucose levels are? 80 to 120. 120. Good job. Good job. So that's going to be important. Um, all right. Diabetes mellitus type 2. This is caused is that, by a I, resistance to the... Yeah. Hey, can I add something back to the diabetes type 1? Sure, go for it. So because we're in Maine and New Hampshire, um, we are allowed to use end title monitoring um, for part of patient assessment. Your patients in DKA should be monitored by end title CO2, and you're going to see lower numbers. Um, and that's one of the things we can utilize. If you have an end title of less than 26, usually that's almost indicative of a patient being in DKA. One of the things you can also help with that diagnosis in the field. So I kind of wanted to add that into it more too. And we'll cover more of that on that Wednesday lecture that I told you guys about um, when we cover capnography. So you said below 26? Yeah, you'll start seeing lower numbers. And that will show the patient's acidotic. Okay. All right. Uh, diabetes type 2 caused by resistance to the effects of insulin at a cellular level. Um, obesity predisposes patients to type 2 diabetes. The pancreas produces more insulin. And okay, they'll start these regimes where they'll increase exercise and dietary restrictions. All right. Um, oral medication can be treat treat can used to be treat huh, can be used to treat type two diabetes. Um, injectable medications and insulin are also used for type two diabetes. So metformin um, is a pill. That's a common one you'll see for people with uh, type two diabetes. They also use it for weight loss now. Uh, often diagnosed at a uh, yearly medical examination for complaints related to high blood uh, glucose levels. This includes uh, reincurrent infections, change in vision, and uh, numbness in the feet. Um, occurs when blood glucose levels are high. Patient is in a state of altered mental status resulting from severe combined problems. In type 1 diabetes, this leads to uh, ketoacidosis with dehydration from excessive urination. In type 2 diabetes, it leads to non-ketotic hypomolar state of dehydration. And Kevin, uh, touch base on that. I think it'll talk about here later on. Um, if an individual has hyperglycemia for a, um, a length of time, consequences of diabetes may present. These are going to be wounds that don't heal, numbness in the hands and the feet, blindness, uh, renal failure, and uh, poor GI issues. Um, one of the big ones we see a lot is wounds and numbness on the feet. They'll get something called a diabetic ulcer, and these these, these wounds that just will not uh, heal and they'll go to hyperbaric treatments, they'll have wound care and all these stuff, these vacuum pumps. And uh, a lot of diabetics who don't maintain um, their health and don't keep their blood sugars under control can actually lose their feet from amputation because of these infections. Uh, when blood glucose, level, glucose levels are not controlled in diabetes, uh, type two, HHNS can develop. Key signs of HHNS include hyperglycemia, altered mental status, drowsiness, lethargy, severe di hate, di dehydration, thirst, dark urine. They're going to have some visual effect or defects, partial paralysis or muscle weakness, and seizures. High glu higher glucose levels in the blood cause excretion of glucose in the urine. Um, increased fluid intake causes the polyuria. Um, urine becomes dark and concentrated, and patient may become unconscious or have seizure activity due to that severe hydration. So this is going to cause them to pee a lot, so much so that they can actually dehydrate themselves just because they're peeing so much. Um, a patient's blood glucose level drops and must be corrected swiftly. Um, so this is hypoglycemia. 
um, can occur in a patient who injects insulin or uses oral medication that stimulates the pancreas to produce more insulin. When insulin levels remain high, glucose is rapidly taken out of the blood. If glucose levels fall, there may be a, an insufficient amount to the, uh, of sugar or glucose to the brain. Some signs of hyperglycemia, uh, mental status of the patient declines, patient may become aggressive or display unusual behaviors, um, unconscious or permanent brain damage can quickly follow. So this is a good time to talk about those patients that appear drunk, okay? It's just because someone appears drunk or intoxicated doesn't mean that they're under the influence of some type of um, body altering substance. It could just be that they have Hyper, hypoglycemia, and I've seen this. I've seen someone be completely violent and beat you up, and then you get their sugar right, and they're the nicest person in the world. So don't, again, first thing, uh, watch your back, make sure you're, you know, you're safe, but don't just jump to conclusions with these patients. Make sure you're doing your full assessments, you're checking blood sugars, you're, you're kind of going down those rabbit holes. Um, common reasons for low blood sugar uh, to develop, uh, Correct dose of insulin with change in routine. So they, they're doing their normal doses, but something's changed. More insulin than necessary. Um, correct dose of insulin without eating significant amounts. Again, we see that a lot in people who are new to pumps, especially in kids. They go out, they're playing, they, they have their insulin pump set up to deliver a dose, and then they don't ever eat because they're outside playing. Their blood sugar drops really quickly. Um, or the correct dose of insulin and the patient develops an acute illness. Uh, when people are sick, it throws their glucose levels all over the place. Um, so even though they're giving their normal dose of insulin, excuse me, if someone is ill, um, it could affect them um, adversely. Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, normal to shallow or rapid respirations, pale, moist skin, diaphoresis, dizziness, headaches, rapid pulse, uh, normal to low blood pressure. These people are normally really sweaty and just out of it. Uh, again, some more signs and symptoms, altered mental status, anxious or combative, seizures, faintings, comas, weakness on the side of a body, um, and rapid changes in mental status. So weakness on one side of the body, what does that make us think of? Stroke. Stroke. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I've seen an ambulance take somebody to the hospital get everybody all worked up saying it's a stroke alert and they go and take the patient's blood sh uh, sugar and it's like 26. <laughs> so don't be that guy. Uh, make sure you're assessing your patient, okay? Um, wasn't me this time, but I've seen it happen. All right. Here's some of those figures. Again, like I said, you all can review this on your own. It just shows you on the left kind of where blood sugar is normal and then some of those other signs. Um, hypoglycemia is quickly reversed by giving patient glucose. Um, without glucose, the patient can sustain permanent brain damage. We know this. We got to treat it or else they can have permanent uh, issues. All right. Talk about scene safety yet again. Patients with diabetes may use syringes, so watch out uh, for needles. Um, be alert for clues. Use standard precautions, question bystanders. Um, and, and, um, this patient may have passed out, fell and hit their head. We don't know. So always suspect that um, if someone's unconscious, that there may be some trauma related. You're going to form a general impression. You're going to check your airway and breathing. Uh, patient shows sign of inadequate breathing. What are we going to do? High flow uh, oxygen. Yeah. Treat it. Right. Yeah. You're going to hyper, hyper, hyper glycemic patients may have small respirations and that sweet kind of fruity breath. Hype O or low blood sugar patients will have normal or shallow to rapid respirations. Circulation. You're going to have dry, warm skin on hyperglycemic patients, uh, moist, pale. Um, hypoglycemia. And I'm talking these guys, when they're really low, they're soaking wet. Um, I've seen them like literally, it looks like something out of Looney Tunes, like they're laying in bed and the outline of their body from the sweat. Um, it's something that usually keys me in that might be blood sugar related. 
uh, rapid weak pulse and uh, sympathetic hypoglycemia. hypoglycemia. The transport decision, provide prompt transport for patients with altered mental status and inability to swallow. Uh, future evaluate, further evaluate, sorry, conscious patients capable of swallowing and able to main airway. So we have two options here, right? Just a little bit. If they're alert enough where they can still swallow, we got something that we can do as an EMT. Um, we, we carry oral glucose. However, if they're altered and they don't have that ability to, to swallow and you, you're a fear that they're going to choke, if you try to give them oral glucose, we're going to get them to the hospital as quickly as we can or call for that ALS back. Make sense? Jason, you, you looked a little concerned. Make sense? All right. Uh, history taking. That was, that was my computer. My computer was the one that was making the noise. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. No, you're good. You're good. Is, All right, is Zach cutting in and out for you guys? Because he's cutting it's, in and yeah. out for me and garbling. Really? All right. Hold on. Let me see if I can figure it out. I apologize. We We're close doing it stuff earlier. Here. Let me just close a bunch of stuff and make sure that's not what it is. It's How am I sounding symptom. now? Perfect. I know. Guys, I might be hypoglycemic. Oh, you're cutting in and out again. All right. Any better? All right, stand by. Any better? Sounding better? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to investigate the chief complaint. We're going to obtain history of the illness. Uh, um, for, see if they're if they're responsive. If not, we're going to talk to family and bystanders. Um, if a patient has has eaten but not taken insulin, we're more likely to see hyperglycemia. Right. Um, if a patient has taken insulin though and they haven't eaten, um, they're more likely to be hypo. So those investigative investigative skills are really important here. Did they eat? That is super important with diabetic patients. Um, and that can really kind of lead you down the path if they're going to be more hyperglycemic and hypo. We're going to do the sample history. All right, review time. Somebody tell me what sample stands for. Signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms. All right. A. Jeez. M. Medications. P. Pertinent past history. L. Last I and O. All right, and E. Event leading up to it. Perfect. You guys got it. All right. So questions we're going to ask for a diabetic. Did you take insulin or pills to lower, or do you take insulin or pills to lower your blood sugar? Uh, another good one is, uh, at least in the South, do you have the sugars? Everyone down here calls diabetes the sugars. I had no clue what that was. It was a learning experience for me. So know your demographic. It's one of those times that they might call it something differently than what we call it in the medical field. Um, ask them if they wear an, an insulin pump. Um, is it working properly? And again, we talked about this earlier. Some people wear those pods that measure blood sugar. Those things can fail. So don't ever trust the reading on those blood sugar machines. Go ahead and do a finger stick with your glucometer. Your equipment is what you should use to diagnose your patient. Um, have you taken your usual insulin dose or pills? Have you eaten normally? Um, or do they feel sick? Or is, is something different than normal? We're gonna do our secondary assessment. We're gonna assess those um, unresponsive patients from head to toe. And when you suspect a diabetic related problem, focus on the mental status and the ability to swallow, especially as an EMT, their ab ability to swallow is huge here. Uh, mental status is important, but if they're still able enough to, they'll follow commands and they'll follow instructions and they can swallow, you can probably turn them around with oral glucose. You just want to make sure you don't mess up their airway by doing that. Any questions there? Everyone knows what oral glucose is. Okay. This nasty, sticky gel it's full of sugar. All right. Sometimes they're tabs. Gel's been the more common thing recently. All right. Final signs. We're going to use a glucometer if uh, available and protocols allow. I'm going to assume where you guys are at, you're able to use a glucometer. Almost everywhere now is, has that 
ability. Um, hypoglycemia restorations again are going to be normal to rapid. The peak, the pulse can be weak and rapid, um, and the skin is typically pale and clammy um, with a possible low blood pressure. Hyperglycemia respirations are going to be deep and rapid. Uh, pulse may be rapid or weak and thready. Skin is going to be warm, almost hot, with dry and a normal blood pressure. I would when, when they, try. Go ahead. When they say respirations are normal to rapid, can you explain that to me? I, I don't, I, I can't grasp. So let me, I think it'll be easier for me to tell you the difference between the two versus hypo and hyper versus to explain normal to rapid. Normal to rapid would be from how I'm breathing now to a little fast, okay? When you have those patients that are in those Kuzmal breathing, it is extensive. Just looked it up. Yeah, that's what like, that sound was. I'm it, sorry. <laughs> you will know what a hypoglycemic patient may seem a little fast, but it's going to be, it's not going to be something that you're going to wow, that's, that's wild. Those people that have those Kuzmal um, respirations, it's going to be pretty obvious that that's something different. And again, you're going to get that usually that fruity breath smell. Um, and you got to kind of pair it with some of the other findings, right? So their skin is warm. They're not really sweaty. Um, they're going to feel kind of antsy. They're still going to be up and kind of talking to you. They don't get as confused as quickly as a hypoglycemic patient does. Those hypoglycemic patients are low blood sugar. They're going to be super sweaty, kind of lethargic, uh, clammy. It, 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 the presentation is completely different. Don't get wrapped up so much on the respirations. But do know that Kuzmal small respirations are those deep, excessive breaths. I just looked it up. Yep. Using YouTube again, so, I'm telling you, sometimes YouTube's the thing. Look up Kuzmal small respirations, and you'll completely understand what I say. It's it's very obvious. So, all so right. One thing, one thing to yeah. Jason. So why do, why do you think they're breathing rapidly then? If they were hypoglycemic, hyper, uh, they're, they're, hyper. In, they're in DKA, right? Hyperglycemia, DKA, right? So why are they why are they breathing so rapid? What is why is the body doing that? That's what I want you guys to understand is is why is that happening? It, is it doing something with uh, the amount of oxygen that the blood has in it? Well, they're so what, what, what is, DKA, think about what does DKA stand for? Diabetic ketoacidosis. So keto acidosis, right? So diabetic ketoacidosis, right? So that, does that mean the patient's acidotic? Mm -hmm. Right. Right? So they're trying to blow off carbon dioxide, which is why they start breathing rapidly. They're trying to blow off to get rid of that extra acid, acid in their system. Right, the body's trying to balance right. themselves. So that's yeah. why they're having that, that those ball respirations, that rapid breathing, then shout and you know, long breath and rapid breathing back and forth. Is this the body's mechanism to meet homeostasis? They want to have that rapid breathing to help blow off some of that acid, which is why you're going to get those end tidal readings. And we talk about this more in that. Sense? Yeah. And Go we ahead. talked about that in the uh, in the respiratory section when I was talking about. You'll notice when people get sick. Sometimes their respiratory rate will pick up. Again, that's because that body's building up that acid. Same thing here at a much higher extent. Okay, so the body is full of acid now, and those lungs are getting as full of capacity and as quickly as they can to try to get that out of their system as quickly as possible. Make sense? All right. All right, glucometers um, refer to the operation manual. <laughs> Um, know the upper and lower ranges of which your glucometers function. So like I said, you're going to have your normal numbers, and then you're going to have some that say low and some that say high. And each monitor varies on what is considered high. Some of them are high after 500. Some are high after 600. So it's a good thing to know because we walk in the in or into the ER and say, well, my glucometer just says high. They're going to ask you and say, well, what's high on your monitor? So you want to say, well, it's over 500 or it's over 600 or low. Well, it's below 20 or it's below 30. Uh, usually 
as far as monitors go, high is the only one. I've never had one say low, and I've seen blood sugars as low as the teens. Um, so it's usually on the high end of things. Normal uh, non-fasting adult and child blood glucoses are uh, between 80 and 120. Neonates uh, should be above 70. All right, we're going to frequently reassess um, and provide the inter, uh, indicated in interventions. So hypoglycemic patients who are conscious and can swallow, we're encourage patients to take glucose tablets or drink some type of sugar-containing drink, uh, possibly give those high concentrated gels and provide rapid transports. Um, don't be afraid if they've got an orange juice right next to them. Hey, let's drink some of that orange juice. You know, the gels, a lot of people don't like it. If they'll drink orange juice, and then remember, these patients are going to be confused. If their airway's clear and they'll drink apple juice or orange juice, get them some apple juice and orange juice. Um, the key is to get their sugar up. Even if they got a Mountain Dew sitting on the table, it's sugar. Okay, so that's the key. All right, interventions for hypoglycemic unconscious risk of aspiration. Those are those people who can't swallow. A patient needs IV glucose or intramuscular or IN glucagon. That's something that you're not going to be giving, right, Kevin, as an EMT? I don't think it's in EMT protocol up there. Don't hold me to it, but I'm almost positive it's not in your all's protocols. Um, usually it's um, ALS care. Uh, if unable to test for uh, blood glucose values, uh, perform a thorough assessment and contact the health hospital to help sort out the signs and symptoms. You're going to have, you're going to want to have, go ahead and load up that patient and get them to a hospital as quickly as you can. Uh, communicate and document. Uh, you want to make sure anybody who refuses transportation after it's improved uh, that you document that. You want to say, hey, when I left, this patient was much better. Their mental status was up there. Um, you know, take time with these patients. Make sure that they're in a good state if they're going to refuse. I will tell you, everything. every time I have a diabetic patient that refuses to go to the hospital for I'll find some peanut butter and bread or something because you want to get some carbs, some heavy carb food to help keep that blood or blood sugar up and level. Those quick sugars like the tablets and the gels can wear off kind of quick. So you want to make sure these people follow up with a real meal afterwards. OK, these are not the patients that you just write a simple narrative like, yep, yeah, went and checked about sugar is low. I gave him some sugar and left. You want to make sure you document well on these uh, to protect yourself, that the patient was alert times four, able to answer all my questions and following commands, um, they ate a good meal or were going to eat a good meal, uh, and then have them sign that refusal. Here are some examples of oral glucose. Some contraindications we've talked about already, the inability to swallow or unconsciousness. Um, Wear gloves before you put anything in a patient's mouth. Uh, they tend to spit, especially if they're really altered, they'll spit it back out at you. Uh, it's also super sticky. So again, just wear gloves. Uh, and you're gonna follow your local protocols for your glucose administration. Again, reassess frequently. Sugars can go up and down pretty rapidly uh, and provide transport. All right. If they're hypoglycemic, they can have seizures. You're going to consider hypoglycemia or an underlying condition. Gosh, I don't know keeps doing that tonight. I'm sorry. Hey, guys. It was 2020, right?
All right, trying to figure out what slide we are on. You're on slide 49. Thank you. I apologize again, guys. I don't know what's going on. Um, so what you're going to do is ensure their airway is clear. Uh, place the patient on their side. Don't put anything in their mouth. You're going to have suction equipment ready, and you're going to provide oxygen and uh, artificially ventilate it um, if, if needed, um, and then transport promptly. Altered mental status uh, may be caused by diabetic complications. Um, use the mnemonic AEIOU. Tips. Does anybody know that one? I'll be honest with you. That's one I don't know. Anybody got it? Does anybody else not see the proper slide? I see like his background of his computer. Yeah, Say again. With the, slide. the slide's about minuscule. Tiny. Even smaller than that. All right, let's see. Are you frozen? Zach? Is that better? No. No. What's going on? With river. Still frozen? Mm hmm. You look right. frozen, and the screen is really small. Hang on. Let's try something here. Must be that cold South Carolina weather. Uh, I don't know what. What's going on? My computer has shut down like three times. All right, can you all see? Let me restart my screen sharing. All right, can you all see it now? No, it's black. No, I see nothing. It's black. They're gone. All I see is Tina and Jason. That's it. All right. Can you and see I me? I see you. No. <laughs> no. Nope. Okay. I'm going to stop this recording real quick. I'm going to um, leave and rejoin, and then I will um, actually, I can't do that because it'll end the call. Give me just a second, guys. I apologize. I don't know what's going on. So I looked up that, that mnemonic that he just said. Go ahead. What is it? Acidosis, alcohol, epilepsy, infection, overdose, uremia, trauma, tumor, insulin, psychosis, and stroke. All right. Can you see my slides yet? Yeah, I'm going to blow them up. Can you see me? I can see you. Okay. Let's see what happens here. Can you see the slides? Yes. yes. Can see the slides. Okay, let's well, fingers crossed and we'll keep moving <laughs> forward here. All right, uh, Tina, again, can you tell us what AEIOU dash tips means? Acidosis, um, acidosis slash alcohol, epilepsy, infection, overdose, uremia, trauma, uh, tumor, insulin, psychosis, and stroke. Okay, guys. So there should be you. two T's. I don't like that one at all. Yeah, I like I've snot, never... though. Snot's good. You want to tell us what snot is? Uh, stroke, seizure, sugar, narcotics, oxygen, trauma, which could be toxins, or and then it says telemetry. Perfect. So if you all have a mnemonic you want to use, just make sure you're assessing for different reasons that could be causing altered mental status. Okay, that's the big key takeaway here. Um, always suspect and check for hypoglycemia in a patient with altered mental status. Again, we touched about this earlier. If you don't know why they're acting different, it's probably a good idea to take a blood sugar. Um, stroke sometimes can, uh, sorry, hypoglycemia can sometimes mimic strokes. It can, uh, can mimic intoxication. You just never know. All right, altered mental status. Ensure the airway is clear. Uh, be prepared to provide ventilations and suction if the patient vomits. Uh, provide prompt transport. Um, make misdiagnosis of neurological dysfunction. Uh, can, like I said, can sometimes be mistaken for intoxication. 
Um, a diet patient, a diabetic patient confined by police is at risk. Again, they're having a medical emergency. What was that? I was just going to mention, these are patients you guys want to get 12 leads done. All right. Rule out cardiac. Remember, in New Hampshire and Maine, you can do that. You can do 12 leads on these patients. You just can't interpret them, but you can at least get the printout. Right. So as EMT level, you can do 12 leads. Which is awesome. You all should be static that you can do that. Um, mm. All right, you're going to look for emergency medical identification bracelets, necklaces, or cards. I also told you the other day about checking people's iPhones. They have a little medical section there. Um, you're going to perform blood glucose test on the scene, or if you can't do it there in the ED. Um, diabetes and alcoholism can coexist in a patient, so they could be both um, having uh, sugar issues and be an alcoholic. They could just be an alcoholic. They could just be a diabetic, but you can't just assume by looking at a patient on what it is. Sorry, did I lose you guys? No, okay. Um, relationships to airway management. Patients with altered mental status can lose their gag reflex. Then vomit in the tongue may obstruct the airway. Make sure you're carefully monitoring the airway, place the patient, and make sure suction is available. Kevin, did you have something? All right, nope, hematologic nope. emergencies. Um, hematology is a study of blood-related diseases. Um, four disorders that can create a simple, or sorry, create a pre-hospital emergency, emergency is sickle cell disease, hemophilia A, throm thrombophilia, and anemia. Do you all need a quick break or you want to keep pushing through? Keep going. I just keep going. All right. Yeah. Everybody good with that? Cool. Yeah. All right. Anatomy and physiology, we're going to talk about um, blood again. Blood is made up of four components. Uh, red blood cells contain the hemoglobin, which carries oxygen to the tissues. Those white blood cells collect dead cells to provide for their uh, correct disposal. You got those platelets that are essential for the clot formation, and plasma serves as that transportation media or that kind of fluid that moves the blood along. All right. So sickle cell disease, it's an inherited disorder and it affects red blood cells. This is predominantly in people of African, Caribbean, and South American ancestry. These lead to dysfunction in oxygen binding and unintentional clot formation. Sickle cells have a short lifespan, uh, resulting in more cellular waste products and uh, contributing to sludge of the blood. The blood's thick. It doesn't hold things appropriately. Um, some complications include anemia, gallstones, jaundice, and uh, splenic dysfunctions. Um, vascular acts or occlusion with ischemia. So you get acute chest syndrome, stroke, joint necrosis, pain crisis, as well, which is a lot of times what they call for, uh, acute and chronic organ dysfunction and failure. Um, retinal hemorrhaging, and uh, increased risk of infection. So you can see here, um, those cells just don't have that typical donut shape. Uh, many of these complications are very painful and potentially life-threatening. So clotting disorders. Uh, let me just touch base real quick on something else, a sickle cell. A lot of times these people... Um, regulars and you got to make sure you keep an open mind uh, this is one of those d diseases that doesn't have a lot of visual cues um, and they, a lot of people with sickle cell kind of get this rap of being frequent flyers or making things up these patients are sick and they do hurt so just remember to be a, uh, a have a good bedside manner and treat your patient appropriately it's a little soapbox there uh, Hemophilia, it's rare. Only about 20,000 Americans have this disorder. Um, hemophilia A affects mostly males. Um, this is the decreased ability to create a clot after an injury. And we talked about this earlier when we were talking about bleeding. Um, this can be life-threatening. Patients can be prescribed medications to replace that missing um, clotting factor. Um, it releases stored clotting factors or prevents the breakdown of blood clots. Um, common complications of hemophilia A include long-term joint problems that may be that may require an early joint replacement, um, bleeding in the brain, and thrombosis due to treatment. 
thrombophilia is a disorder in the body's ability to maintain flow of blood flow through the venous and arterial system. Um, it's basically concentrations of particular elements in the blood that creates almost like a, a roadblock or clogging, uh, clogging issues. Uh, general terms for conditions that result in blood getting clotted more easily than normal. Um, so their blood clots really, really easy. Um, clots can, can spontaneously develop in the blood of the patient. So hemophilia, we got the blood won't clot. Thrombophilia, it clots a lot and really easy. Um, some other clotting disorders are DVTs or deep vein thrombosis or thrombose eye, I guess. Uh, common medical problem in sedentary patients and patients who have recent injury or surgery. You also can see this in patients who have taken long trips, sitting in an airplane for 12, 20 hours, something like that. Um, they can get these clots in their legs. Um, way that they prevent that is blood thinning medications, really tight compression socks, and just mechanical devices that keeps those legs moving. Um, there's something called SCEDs in the hospital. I don't know if anybody has ever seen these, but they're basically these big tubes they put on people's legs and they squeeze and kind of massage the legs to keep that blood flowing. Um, and then some risk factors are joint replacement surgeries, um, and again, staying sedentary for a long period of time. Any questions on those? Oh. Some, some, does somebody have a question? All right, some treatments. So they're going to get the anticoagulation therapy, those blood thinners. These medications are typically administered for at least three months after a diagnosis of a DVT. Um, a clot from the DVT, and this is important, guys. If someone has a DVT, they're at risk um, for pulmonary embolisms and strokes because those clots can travel. Uh, they'll hit right in the blood system, travel to different parts. All right, anemia, an abnormally uh, low number of those red blood cells. Blood is, is unable to deliver the adequate amount of oxygen to the tissues, so they don't have those carrying capacities. Um, pulse ox may indicate an, an adequate saturation, even though the tissues are hypoxic. So again, pulse ox is me measuring what's attached to a red blood cell, not particularly on how many red blood cells are there. So how are we going to treat these patients? What's the scenario like? Okay, again, scene safety, the most Key important thing here, um, most sickle cell patients will, who will have had a crisis before. So like I said, these people have these pretty regularly. You wanna make sure you wear gloves and eye protection at a minimum and then consider ALS support. And I, I would say even just for pain control, sometimes it's nice to have that, uh, that ALS support there. You're gonna perform your typical um, cervical spine immobilization. You're gonna form that general impression. You're gonna inspect their airway and check their breathing. Um, Again, if inadequate breathing is noted or an altered mental status, you're going to treat that uh, with high flow oxygen. Um, sickle cell crisis patients may have may have increased respiration or sign of pneumonia. Just manage that as appropriately as you can. Circulation. Sickle cell patients have an increased heart rate. Um, suspected hemophilia patients be uh, be alert for those blood loss. Like I said, those are the ones that are going to bleed and not stop easily. So just keep an eye out on those. Um, they also can bleed for just an unknown source. So have your investigation skills turned up. Be alert for signs of hypoxia and then make a transport decision. And again, investigate. We're going to attain the history of the present uh, illness uh, from responsive patients. We'll ask those around if they're not responsive. Um, and then we got our physical signs of sickle cell crisis, swelling of the fingers and toes, prior prism, and jaundice. Any questions of that, of those? All right, everybody still hear me? It's pretty quiet. I can't see your all's faces now because I've had to unplug some monitors. No, I'm good. Okay, good. It's I was good. worried for a second I was talking to myself. I'm being <laughs> lagging, right. but... It's not that bad. OK, I'm sorry, guys. Technology is not happy with me right now. All right. You're not the computer. So more about the history taken. Yeah, right. Um, single location. So is that pain or is that symptom at a single spot or felt throughout the body? How's your vision? Are, are you seeing things weird or is the thing? Are things blurry? Do they not seem focused? 
Um, you're gonna ask them if they're nauseous, or they've been vomiting, do their, uh, does their abdomen hurt? And then ask for chest pain and shortness of breath. And again, this is another time as an EMT, it'd be a good time to do a 12 lead just to help uh, further investigate uh, what's going on. You're gonna obtain that sample history. Have you had this crisis before? When was the last time? How did your last crisis resolve? Any recent illnesses um, or unusual amount of activity or stress? We're gonna get that secondary assessment done. We're gonna focus on the joints. We're gonna evaluate and document uh, mental status using AFPU. Can anybody tell me what AFPU stands for? Alert. Alert. All right. Verbal. The is yeah. what? Verbal. All right. And Good. unresponsive. Perfect. All right, we're going to get those vital signs, um, obtain a complete set of vital signs. We're going to look for signs of sickle cell crisis, and we'll use a pulse ox if available. Assess those signs frequently, evaluate for interventions if needed, adjust or change those interventions, and then we're going to document, uh, document the assessment and those interventions. Make sure, again, we communicate with the hospital staff for the cont continuity of care and make sure we document clearly. All right. Uh, emergency medical care for hematological disorders. Pretty sympathetic um, patients will um, with inadequate breathing or altered mental status. We're going to provide high flow oxygen to. Um, we're going to keep them in a position of comfort and transport them to the hospital. All right, you all ready to knock out this review? Need a yep. break? Just push through. Push through. Let's all right. go. Type 1 diabetes and in which anybody give me an answer. D. 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 All right. I heard a D. D. It's actually gonna be B. Uh, I thought it was because it didn't produce enough. Well, it fails produce enough or produce it doesn't none at produce all. Insulin. It's, what? It doesn't produce insulin, so you can't utilize the glucose. Yes. Um, insulin is a hormone that promotes the uptake of sugar from the bloodstream and into the cells. Without insulin, glucose utilization is impaired because um, the inability to produce enough insulin or any insulin. I'll leave these rationales up for a second to you guys to check out. Cool. Responsive, which of the following questions is most important to ask his wife? Shout out some answers for me. A. A. Perfect. Anybody else have any other ones? All right. All right. Any questions on that one? Cool. All right. Number three. A diabetic patient presents with a blood glucose level of 310 and, and severe dehydration. The patient's dehydration is a result of. B. A. Got B and A. What does everybody else say? Got another A. All right. A is the correct one here. Remember, these people are going to be um, excreting that excess glucose that the kidneys are going to make you pee all the time. These people pee constantly. All right. Just uh, uh, as a reminder, you can tell me what the normal glucose levels are. 20. Over 20. Yeah. All right. What about a neonate? We need to have a 70. blood sugar over what? 70. Good job, guys. All right. Uh, which combination of factors would most likely cause a hypoglycemic crisis in a diabetic patient? So what would cause someone to have a low blood sugar? B. I said that we'd see this in kids B. sometimes. B. 
Sleepy. All right. He is in boy. Good job, guys. Good. They they didn't eat and they did, they took their normal doses of insulin. All right. A 19 year old diabetic male was found unresponsive on the couch by his roommate. After confirming the patient is unresponsive, you should. B. Yeah, B. Good job, guys. You all are on top of it. Remember your ABCs. What breathing would you most likely encounter in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA? So they got that acid. C. They can see. C. 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 Kusmol. Kusmol. Yes, look up that uh, on YouTube. That way you can kind of see what it looks like. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody have a question? No, you were lagging okay. and I thought you were stuck. Yeah, <laughs> I thought the same All thing right. too. I'm like, I thought you were <laughs> We're almost through it, guys. A woman called EMS because her 12 year old son, who had been experiencing excessive urination, thirst, and hunger for the last 36 hours, he has an altered mental status and is breathing fast. You should be most suspicious for B. D. D. D is in David, right? Yeah. Yep. He's having a crisis. All right, guys. Good job. D. Child experiencing a hyperglycemic crisis secondary to severe hyperglycemia. Any questions on that one? Nope. If cells do not receive glucose, they will begin to metabolize. Okay. Hey. Heard a heard a name. Good job. Good job. Good job. Right, nine. Right? Yeah, yes. Uh, number nine. In contrast to a hyperglycemic crisis, a hypoglycemic crisis. Okay. Everyone he is agree? David. D. D. He is David. All right. Good job. You guys have got a good grasp on this. All right. Number 10. And patient with diabetic ketoacidosis experienced polydipsia because. Anybody? A. Does anybody, does everyone know what polydyspia is? Excessive That's thirst. gonna be your um, excessive <laughs> thirst. So, all right, cool, yeah, A, good job. All right, number 11, when dealing with hematological disorders, the EMT must be familiar with the composition of blood. Which of the following is considered a hematologic, hem, hematologic disease? D. 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 Got it. You all are quick on that one. All right. What are the two main components of blood? Think about it. B. D. B. Oh. Bob. Dog, right? Yeah. No, Bob. Bob. Think about it, guys. You have your red, cells, red blood white cells, cells, your white blood cells, and then what carries it? Plasma. Plasma. All right. Everyone feel okay with that one? Yep.
The assessment of a patient with a hematological disorder is the same as with any other patient an EMT will encounter. In addition to obtaining a sample history, EMT should ask which of the following questions? D. Yeah. All right, one pretty easy one. All right, which of the following? Are we following taking a quiz or following? something? Do I? What are we taking the quiz? This is way more than 10 questions. I know. This is a log one. Uh, <laughs> which of the following is not an appropriate treatment for EMTs to provide to a patient who has a hemological disorder? Not appropriate. A. 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 All right. You sure it's not B? Definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> All right. Good job, guys. All right, that is all I have. And again, I apologize, you guys, uh, my computer and everything else tonight. Um, can I answer any questions for you? Let me stop this recording. Kevin, I have, is Kevin on? Oh. Yeah, I'm here. Is it, what time are we meeting in Berlin this weekend? What is it, nine to five in Berlin? Correct. Nine to five in Berlin this weekend. Is that, is so, that what I, I always I, thought, I always forget the time people start. Is it eight to five? No. Yeah. No, it's nine. 